Amen. Glory be to the name of our Lord, my dear brethren. We thank Him for this chance that we have once again to stand before the written word of our Lord and to hear the messages from the Holy Spirit. I'd like us to read from uh, the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 14 and verse 13. The Gospel according to Matthew, 14, verse 13. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a desolate place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from, from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed the sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, Bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass, and he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who, were, who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the, in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And on the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. We thank the Lord, my dear brethren. The Word of God says that Jesus heard. What did He hear? Well, He was in a place where people had gathered and they heard the Word of God. Lucky people, someone would say in brackets. People who had the privilege, the right to stand across from the sun and the Word of God, and to hear by the Holy Spirit, by the Lord Himself, messages that touched their heart. This can be seen. You can tell this by the, the scene that you can see there. There were people who did not leave Him all day, one day, two days. They stood there and listened to Him, and the Lord spoke to them. He spoke to them in simplicity. He entered their heart. He spoke to their problems. The Word of God grabbed them, and they, being sincere, accepted His Word. He benedicted them. He healed people. This happened during the period that our Lord was down here on earth with the mission that He had taken from God. And He heard that they arrested John. The message isn't good. The news that happened in, in the life of John were not good. He was caught. He was in difficulty. The man of God, servant of the Lord. And he is in difficulty not because he is in sin or something like that, but he wants to do the will of God. Without uh, lenience, without giving up, without standing back, he had made the decision to preach the word of God. He rebuked where it was necessary. He stood 
He took a stance as a sincere man, as a holy man of God. He wanted to stand in the presence of God and he paid for it. And everyone who wants to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. A rule of life. And the Lord heard this. And what did He do? What did John expect? What did the disciples expect that were following Him? What did they expect the Lord to say? Let us go run and pull Him out of prison. Let us free our disciple, our, our, our teacher. That is what we think many times. That is how we as people plan many times. We know the story, how it unraveled. We know what happened after this problem that came in John's life, how it ended up. But what I want us to see here, right now, my brethren, is that whenever, when it happened, that nightfall came, the disciples appeared to him, and they presented the problem to Jesus. And here, it's acceptable. But up to here, God wants us to mention to him what's going on. The disciples of the Lord went facing a problem. They presented it as it was. They said, Lord, let us tell you this now. The place is def desolate where we are. It's a deserted place. Time has passed. And there's a problem here. But what they made as a mistake is what follows, my brethren. And we do this many times as well. To God we shall share what is happening to us. We will mention our problem to Him, the difficulty that we're in. But we shall not become His advisors. We shall not tell Him how to solve the problem. The thing that the Lord did not want His disciples to say <coughs> was what they did say. Granted that He knows all things, He knows everything. He cares about everything. He cares about me, He cares about you. <coughs> he cared about the multitudes. He knew what He was going to do. He knew how he was going to solve the problem. And what he wants from his man, his son, his, his daughter, is yes, to share your problem with him, but then to trust him and to wait for the solution the way that he's going to bring it, and the way that he wills it. What they suggested was, send them away. Sensible solution proposed by the disciples. They say, Lord, send them away. What's the, it's the most logical thing to do. Send them away so they can go and find food. And if they want, they'll return. But at this phase now that we are in, in this circumstance, we propose it to be done this way. come from this? Did they not expect the Lord to turn around and to tell them, because just try to imagine how they receive these words. They have nowhere to go, Lord, but they will not go, they will not leave, you will give them something to eat. And the man of God having his situation in mind, the disciples knowing their weakness and be and their ability to respond to this demand, they must have thought, what is he saying? How can we, with this short supply of food that we have, feed this whole army, this whole multitude of 5,000 men without the women and children? Is it possible? Is it sensible? And many times, some things in our life do not seem logical. But why? Why should he why should God bring such a proposal, a suggestion? And many times we cannot observe God, my dear brethren, and the way that his plan is unraveling before us in our life. We just can't trust him. 
and we cannot believe in Him, cannot trust Him, and we do not understand. It's the truth. It's human. And the reaction of the disciples it was strange but human. What are you saying? And think, my dear brethren, the Word of God says, when the Lord told them, what do you have with you? They said, five loaves of bread and two fish. The Lord told them something that is very nice and has to become our lesson today. My brother, whatever you have in your life, as long as you hold it in your hands, it will remain at the size that it has and less. Whatever we have in our life, if it's le small or anything, it has to change hands. The Word of God says, the Lord said, bring these things to me. What do you have? We have small strength. We have small faith. Maybe just a bit of love. A few things, small things. We are in weakness, Lord. We do not have a lot of things. But whatever you have, brother, bring it to me, the Lord says. For we see what will follow. He commanded then the multitudes to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, blessed them, and He gave them to the disciples. And, I, and I'd say now, imagine what happened in the mind and the hearts of the disciples when they went to the multitudes and they told them, Sit here in groups because tonight you will eat. With what heart Peter must have gone, James and John, and grab 15 or 20 people and tell them, sit down in groups. But they had a very nice, very good equipment, and we have as well this equipment that we have to use as an answer. Sit here because the Lord said that you will eat today. And you have a very serious reason. Why should I sit here? What's the reason? We have nothing to eat here. We're in weakness. We don't have bread. We don't have anything. Is there a reason? We say sometimes, why should I stay? I get no answer to my petition. I don't have much blessing. No matter what happens in your life, stay here. No matter how things may come in your life, remain in Christ. Stay here. Of course, Peter and James and the disciples within them have a short heart. The Lord said so. They have a small hope. He is almighty. He will find a way. I do not know how. I do not know if they thought or if they believed the words of Christ. Or if it, would, it was revealed to them how it would be done. I do not believe. I do not know. But it's a bit difficult. <laughs> and have in mind, my brother, that God is keeping surprises in your life for you. And God holds some surprises for us. Nice surprises. He has a very good plan for you. You can't see it, though. I cannot see it. Even more, from some events and situations, it is cancelled out as well. What kind of a plan is this? You see, we don't have food to eat here. What kind of a plan are you talking about? And the Apostle Peter, James and John suddenly found themselves with their hands full. Because their hands were filled by the Lord. As He multiplied His bread. As he performed this marvelous miracle, satisfaction came, fullness came, they were blessed, everyone ate and were satisfied. They sat there and enjoyed themselves. It's nice. The Lord blessed the bread, the Lord blessed us, He brought us to prosperity. We're having a good time here. We have Christ among us. We're eating well. Receive the blessings from the Lord. And immediately the Lord forced the disciples to go into the boat. But is it necessary? How many times, my dear brethren, is our life turned upside down without us being able to explain it? And it doesn't require a lot. 
just one moment. The disciples said, is it necessary, Lord? But weren't we fine? And what I said about John before, he himself must have said, I'm good here, Lord. I preach the word of God. I live for you. I serve in your work. I'm good here, Lord. Leave me here. Is it necessary for me from one moment to the other to find myself in the prison of Herod? Why, Lord? Why should you permit this overturning in my life? I cannot understand it. I cannot explain it, Lord. John will have been crying out from prison. My Lord Jesus, I can't explain this. Why did you permit this in my life? And as within him all these things are working, he just can't stand it anymore. And the Word of God says, He sent two of His disciples. It isn't easy. It's very humiliating. The teacher sent two of His disciples. The man who spoke and the Word of God says had disciples around Him, listening to Him. Maybe these disciples could have been before Him at the hour when He heard by the Holy Spirit, by the revelation of God, Behold the Lamb of God who lifts the sin of the world. The one who is coming is greater than me because he is before me. And those disciples might have been in front of her, in front of that situation. And now these disciples see their teacher in weakness, in problem. You know what message he sent to the Lord? You know what he doubts? The precise thing that he had as a revelation in the beginning. And many times thing co things come in such a way that we find ourselves in difficulty even to the point of not accepting the basic doctrines, the basic things. The moment comes when the devil brings you to such a point that it pushes you to the point of doubting the Word of God, the voice of God and His promise in your life. What did John say? Tell the Lord. What should we tell him, John, teacher? Tell him. Are you the coming one, or do we wait for another? Did I make a mistake? Could this not have been the voice of God for me? Could this not have been the revelation by the Holy Spirit when I said, Behold the Lamb of God that lifts the sin of the world. It was God, my brother, and the revelation by God was this. But, John man of God with the revelations from God with the blessings from God and John you have come to this point how is it possible it's possible he's man and the shake in my life was very hard and it's unexplainable too I who preached and said that I have Christ, that God is with me. I who cried out, I went by the cages and the prisoners and I said, You who are in there in the prisons, call for Christ so He can come and open the door for you. And so you can come out. Where is Christ now to open my prison gate? Does He not love me? Has He rejected me? Has he left me? He has left me alone, locked in this cage. Where is the Lord? Where is my Lord? The one before whom I knelt and prayed to, and he filled me in the Holy Spirit, and he spoke me by the Holy Spirit. Where is Christ, the Christ that I love? Let him come at this moment and open the cage for me. We'll see it later on. He's not coming. He's not coming to satisfy my petition. The Lord, my dear brethren, says, He forced His disciples to go onto the boat and just look at the, wor the words that He speaks to them. And He says, And it is necessary for this written Word of God, this Word that has been revealed to you by the Holy Spirit in the form of promise, 
of the oracle of God, the promise of God, this word that has been inscribed in your heart and some blessing moments that you had with the Lord, it is necessary at such hours, such moments, it to exist in your heart alive. At such moments, we need the word of God, my brethren. So what did he say to them? Go into the boat and we will go across. And the promise of God in your life is, I have put you in a boat. No matter what happens on the course of this boat, I, God, am going to take you across. I'm going to take you to heaven. I want it. It is my desire. You want it as well. And since you want it, nothing will be able in this life to interrupt this course of yours. You are going to heaven. God wants it. Will I go? We'll see later on how the disciples are tested. Because the action is what reveals my beloved brethren. Of course, they have the word of God to enter into the boat and to go across until he le sets, lets the disciples go. It's not the multitude that go in the boat. The disciples go. Not everyone goes in the boat. Not everyone goes through the turmoil. Not everyone goes through this trial. Not everyone is tried. The disciples though will be tested because no one disqualified or unproved shall go to heaven. So there must be a form of turmoil in our life. And it must come. Many times the, the waves struck one after the other, and they're strange and great. And after he sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain on his own to pray. And when evening came, he was alone up there on the mountain. His disciples? Hmm. His people? His beloved disciples, where are they? I do not know if we realize this, but God loves you, my brother. Church of Christ, God loves you. I'd say that we are the object of God's desire. He deals with us, and it's a beautiful thing. God deals with you, spends time on you. But here, we'll see an, an image, an illustration, that is very despairing for the disciples. I'd say their life is really shaken, their heart. Why? Because the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And He is not coming. In Mark, the Word of God mentions something. It says, The Lord was up on the mountain and was looking at them. And you know that the eyes of God are upon you tonight. Who's God? The God that we have the honor of Him being among us tonight. Jesus Christ is walking here among us tonight. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them, says the world. But there is also the Holy Spirit that is inside us and testifies that the Lord is here among us. Where is He? I cannot see Him. The disciples are rowing. He saw them from up on the, on the mountain that they were tired of rowing. And what would have they said within themselves? Don't we tell them so? I told you so, Lord. I won't stand it. I won't be able. Do not permit something like this in my life. I won't be able to hold it. Didn't I tell you beforehand? I won't be able to do it. Lord, I told you before and we protested. Where are you putting us now? Why are you putting us through such, a, such trouble? We know our strengths. We know that we're going to go through difficulty. Why do you permit this difficulty, Lord? And within them, they would have had this great complaint. Definitely. Okay, He put us here. We're in this tempest. In this boisterous wind. But where is He? And the question is, Lord, where are you tonight? You see that I'm hurting, that I'm suffering. I'm sick. I have difficulties in my life. Where are you, Lord? 
a very nice verse. Two or three verses Job mentions in chapter 23. He says, Today my complaint is great. My wound is not healing. What complaint do you have? I'm sick. I'm calling to him and he's not coming. I'm in pain. I'm suffering. I have a wound that is open in my life. And it's not healing. I'm asking for him to come and he's not coming. Where is he? Has he forgotten me? Has he denied me? Is he man? Has he rejected and denied his promises? Did he lie when he said that he loved me? When he said that I was his, I'm his child and he cared about me, could he lie? Could he have lied? With such stances, many times we create complaints to God. But Isaiah says, rejoice, heavens. Let your heart, let the earth rejoice. Let the, the mountains sound, resound, because the Lord has comforted His people. These are the words of God. These are the words that come from heaven. These are the words that come from the Holy Spirit. But what does the people say? What does the bride say? But Zion says, the Lord has forsaken me. God has stopped loving me. Because if He did love me, He would answer to my, uh, my petition as I asked Him. Because if He said that He cared about me, then where is He? And God many times is forced to, ex to express Himself with complaint. What are you saying that I have, con I have abandoned you? I have inscribed you on my hands. How have I abandoned you? What do you think? I took you from the world of sin. I put you in a desert place and I left you alone. No, I'll be with you all the days of your life. Yet the complaint is created many times as the disciples here. Time goes by. What does logic say? One more wave, and it will be the greater wave, and we will sink. And many times, many times we, we think that God will not intervene. We, we erase it, like it's like a law for us. Many times we, we exclude e the, the intervention of God. We expect everything except the intervention of God. We, the disciples expected everything they would have planned, brother, any time now, will sink. They went through four watches of the night. We cried out to Him, we called Him, we prayed to Him, but nothing. Would He let us sink? Will we just die in the sea? And many times man creates scenarios. But let us see. Has God spoken? All people speak. But has God spoken? And it may be that in your life everyone has spoken, has made conclusions. But God hasn't spoken yet. And suddenly, in the darkness, in their anxiety, something appears there. Something is walking on the waves. And when man has lost his faith within him, when he's lost his hope, as it happens with us many times, where will his mind go? We had everything. We were, we were in trouble. We are in difficulty. We have problems. And here come ghosts. There's a ghost coming toward us. How, how, how do we lose this vision of ours, my dear brethren, many times when clouds cover our skies? Mary, what do you say? What are these things that you're saying, Mary? What am I saying? I am crying outside the tomb. He's not here. My Lord is taken, Mary said. I have lost my Lord. I've lost the support of my life. My life has no meaning for me now. The Lord has, is gone. And if you lose Christ, brother, you've lost everything. We may lose many things in our life. It is definitely harm. But if you lose Christ, 
And Mary lost Christ. And many times, within despair of ours and this disappointment, we become like Mary. It's the clouds of despair. And he, she looks at the, the Lord and she thinks He's the gardener. And I ask and say, Yes, okay, in the darkness, Mary, you didn't look at Him well. And then the darkness of dawn. You couldn't see His form. He may, he may change form, but His voice never changes. The voice is the same. The voice of God is the same. The Lord is speaking to you, brother. The Lord spoke to you. They started a discussion with the Lord, and Mary did not understand anything because she is in despair and disappointment. Clouds of disappointment covered her life. She has lost her vision, and she did not understand that it is Christ. What are you asking for? What are you seeking? Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Whom are you asking for? But because you are sincere, and because it is just uh, temporary, you don't want much, hear your name, Mary. Mary. The reaction, teacher, Rabbanai. Man returns to his senses. How nicely, my dear brethren, does God work in the heart of man. How patiently He puts up with us. The two disciples were walking there that afternoon of the resurrection. They were very disappointed. And you know, two disappointed people walking together is a tragedy. When two people walk together and one is more desperate than the other, Brother Cleopas, we're lost. Yes, brother, you're right. We're sinking, brother, definitely, can't you see? The Lord betrayed us. Yes, you're right, brother. We thought that He was the Son of the living God, but He wasn't. We thought that He is the one that would save Israel. We thought that He was the Son of God, but He wasn't, brother. Yes, yes, you're right. He wasn't Him. Oh, my. They walked together, and one would make the other more desperate than he was. And suddenly, as they were talking, the Lord among them. But they couldn't see Him with their eyes. And okay, they couldn't see Him. He was in a different form. But they were talking with, for, with Him for so long, and their heart could not open so they can understand that Christ was there with them. They discuss things with Him. The Lord does not pretend His voice to be other. His voice is one. It can't change. They started discussing. And He let them open their heart and show Him everything they had inside and increase their faith. How many times does this not happen with us, my dear brethren? Man loses his vision and he just can't discern with whom he is talking. Of course, the Lord told him, Fear not, it is I. There on the waves. And let us stand in this amazing experience of Apostle Peter, this man that lived the Lord, lived with the Lord very near to him, very close to him, many experiences, many mistakes, many lessons through his mistakes, training, admonition from the Lord. This was his life. For three and a half years, and the other disciples as well, but Peter, as the Word of God mentions, there was training for them. And unfortunately, most things in our life, we shall learn through difficult situations. So Peter answered and said, Imagine, nothing is calm yet. There's still boisterous wind. There's still a storm around them. He is desperate. He is disappointed. He is tired from rowing. He hears the Lord speaking to him from afar and saying, Don't be afraid, it is I. And it appears that something sparkles within him. There is some light that shines within him. A message of hope comes to his heart. And you know God has a way, my dear, beloved brethren, in how He will comfort you. He knows. Only He knows how to comfort. How can we know, my brethren? How do we know how God takes a soul in His hands and He works it through in a, such a way as He will take Peter in His hands now to work with Him? The Apostle Peter wants to try the Lord. Not as we many times ask from Him. What do we say many times? Heal me, Lord, so I can glorify You. Give me an answer to my petition so I can say, Yes, here, God loves me, and God is with me. 
He answered my petition. That's it. Job speaks an amazing verse. Even if he kills me, I shall hope in him. The Lord is alive, my Redeemer. And even if he puts me to death, I shall worship him and hope in him. Not if he so solves my problem. Not if he put the, the loose ends in my life to bay, at bay. But if he puts me to death. Because he saw death acting upon him. He saw death working on him. Here Peter will seek something from the Lord. He says, Lord, it's a chance for me now. What do you want, Peter? If it is you. If you are the Christ that I love. The Son of God in whom I have believed. I want to try something tonight at this crucial night. This night of trial with the waves. Command me, Lord, to walk on the waves. Not command the sea to become concrete so I can walk or calm the sea. But Lord, teach me to walk on the waves so I can step on them and worship you. To walk on the waves and to give glory to you on the waves. What do you want, Peter? Lord, I want to have problems and difficulties. Okay, but I want to glorify you through them. I want to set these things aside. Now come. Come, Peter. Come to this first time of your life experience that you're going to live. Come so we can walk together. Come so we can meet on the waves. Within difficulty, within trial, even though the sea hasn't quieted down yet. Let us bring our hands together, God and man, stepping on the waves. Come, Peter. So Peter, coming down from the, from the boat, walked on the waves. He walked on the sea. You know that it's a miracle that you're still in Christ, brother? How do you think you've remained in Christ so many years? Who's holding on to you? If, if it wasn't for Christ, where would you be? Where would I be, brother? I do not know. Would you be? Would we be? Would we exist? We may even be dead. Can you imagine your life without Christ? How would our life be? And here, what does Peter say? He says, he walked upon the waters so he can go to Jesus. He believed that he could do it. Yes, God will give you faith, brother. I won't manage it, Lord. It is difficult, Lord. Could I reach some boundaries and limits of myself? I will not let you be tested above your strength. Which means that since I will not let you, means that I'm holding on to you. And your life is controlled by God, my brethren. You're not without master. You have a master, a Lord, who is holding your life in His hands. Along with this Lord, you must walk, and you will walk, and you will reach the other side. Because what is the purpose? To go to heaven. And whatever way, whatever, you know what God wants deep inside is to see you in heaven. And okay, he was walking on the waves, but then he saw the wind was boisterous and he was afraid. Okay, why didn't he look at the wind so long? Because his eyes were fixed on Christ. Don't take your eyes off Christ, brother. Many times we get cross-eyed in our life. We become spiritually cross-eyed. By losing from before us the Lord, and we look elsewhere. And where will man turn his eyes? To the waves. Couldn't you look at the air so long? Wasn't, didn't you see the wind so long that you were walking on the waves? Didn't you see the waves, how big they were before? No, I was, I was drawn to the Lord. I could only see God. And walking by faith on the waves, I approached Christ. And that is how it is. That's how it's done. God cannot, does not let you see how big the, the wave is. Because you'll be terrified. And of course, he has a valve, a safety valve, and he says, What is this mountain before you, Jerobabel? 
It is a valley. How is it a valley? It's a mountain. When you see it from above, it's a valley. When we look at it from below, upward, when we look at it from the valley, it's a big mountain. It's a big problem. But when God takes you up on the mountain of transfiguration, and you are in the presence of God, how will you see it from above? It's just a valley. It's nothing. He was walking on the waves, but suddenly he saw the winds, and he began to sink. And he cried out and said, Lord, save me. He cried him and said, Lord, save me. Doesn't he have any pride in him to say, I'll manage on my own. You're sinking, you're sinking. Peter is sinking. And that is how he feels. And he accepts the situation. He says, I've lost my faith, Lord. I lost my vision, Lord. I can't see you. I see the wave and I'm sick. I'm sinking, save me. And the Lord caught him. This Peter, my dear brethren, this man, will come to a very bad situation in his life at some point. He will find himself in a very bad point. He didn't expect it. And many times, who can imagine? And we wonder with ourselves. And we say, but me? How did I end up like this? Could the Apostle Peter ever imagine they would reach a point before a slave girl? Powerless slave girl. Afraid. Probably because of his life. To say, let him be accursed, I do not know him, I tell you. Let him be accursed. Accur let him be accursed, I don't know the man, he said. But I believe sincere as he was, he must have had a tr tremendous experience within him. And his heart must have been beating and said, Lord, what did I say? For whom am I saying this? For the one with whom I walked upon the ways. They walked together. Do I not have the boldness? Do I not have the strength, strength to stand and say, Yes, I belong to Christ. He didn't have this strength. He lost his faith again. But I want to share one other example, one other event. So we can see, my beloved brethren, how God in the end does not stand upon these things, does not hold a grudge. Many times man holds a grudge, he says, yes, but this and this and that. No, God doesn't have such things. He doesn't hold on to anything. God doesn't repay your, evil, your mistakes. God is good, my brethren. If it were so, He would have kept, kept it in mind with me. What do you want, Peter? You want the Holy Spirit? I don't think so. You denied me three times. Remember what you said in the praetorium. What do you want, Peter, to work for God? Who, you? Huh. Not even John. Because John was before this amazing experience of Peter. He saw it. He heard it. He heard his brother, the Apostle Peter, saying, Let him be accursed. I do not know him. Even his brother forgave him. If it were you or I. <laughs> oh, man. We would have marked it down. And we would have struck him with it sometimes. What do you want, brother? Blessing. Just remember what you said back there in the praetorium. God doesn't do these things, my brother. God gives. God erases. Not only does He erase, but sometimes He comes in a marvelous way and He meets the Apostle Peter in Tiberias in the sea. The victor meets the loser. The one who triumphed with the one who may have accepted the eyes of Christ, the eyes of compassion and forgiveness. But still within him, he wants something more. And many times, my dear brethren, man some something, something more from God to be assured that God is ready to give it. And though they meet, and he look his, looks at him in the eyes. And though Peter ought to have fallen on the feet of Christ in full of fear, I'd say. I would say, Lord, do you love me? Do you continue to love me, Jesus, after what I did? After this denial of three times, Lord, do you continue to love me? But Christ many times becomes a beggar of a love. And He says, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Child, do you continue to love me after what happened to you? 
Your love was shaken, Peter. You lost your faith, Peter. You changed your opinion upon me, about me? No, Lord. I continue to love you. And now even more, because I thank you very much. Only you know how to forgive, Lord. Only you know how to have mercy upon man. I did this thing in my life, but you came and forgave me. I will, I owe you eternal debt for what you did, Lord. And we have an eternal, uh, gratitude toward Christ, my brethren. It is the main reason for which you must love him, my brother. He healed me. Good, a good reason. He solved the, uh, gave me a solution to my job. He kept my children. It's a very good reason to love Christ. But He shed His blood for you. And this is the amazing reason for you to continue to love Christ forever. May the Lord bless us. Amen.